Vigilant, tireless, implacable. The most silent service of the United States in peace or war is the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bureau went to war with Germany long before hostilities began. No word or picture could then make public the crucial war service of the FBI. But now it can be told. In 1939, with thousands of known and suspected enemy agents invading the Americas, the FBI started building up its force of special agents and employees from 2,000 to a war peak of 15,000. Before being sent into the field, each new agent had to learn all the modern techniques of crime detection, such as the use of a specially treated X-ray mirror through which an FBI man can see without being seen. The Federal Bureau of Investigation had to be the world's most efficient intelligence and counter-espionage service. For war is thought, and thought is information. And he who knows most strikes hardest by examining the intercepted mail of unsuspecting Nazi agents the FBI uncovered many secret channels of communication between the lines of an innocent appearing letter invisibly coded in an obsolete German shorthand were important instructions for one group of spies. The Bureau's infinitely painstaking system of sifting and recording every scrap of potential information paid handsome dividends. The FBI was adding new names to its long list of Germans known to be dangerous. And each day, as fresh investigative reports came in from the field, FBI officials saw more clearly the pattern of German espionage in the United States. Nucleus of the Nazi network in America was the German embassy in Washington, protected until a declaration of war by diplomatic immunity. Long before December 7, 1941, from a vantage point nearby, G-men photographed the actions of hundreds of suspects. These are the actual films taken by the FBI. They gave Director Hoover and his men a daily record and description of all embassy visitors. This continuous photographic surveillance provided a permanent record to be studied intensively whenever new developments took place. The Bureau soon discovered that the embassy was being used to disperse money for subversive activity in the United States. The Bureau also knew that the embassy had a shortwave radio and was in direct communication with Germany. No one was watched more closely by the FBI than the arrogant Baron Ulrich von Gienen. Although accredited as an embassy official, he was actually chief of the German Gestapo in America. Equally important were pompous Vice Admiral Witov Emden and his suave assistant, Helmut Raber, experts in obtaining information about ships and cargoes. Dr. Hans Thompson, the German charge d'affaires, tried to win American collaborators. So did his associate, General Karl Bottisch. Parading before hidden FBI cameras were the embassy secretaries. These girls spent evenings in the company of American servicemen. They were having fun, but they were also diligently accumulating information for Germany. The FBI watched them discreetly, knew all about them. By relentless surveillance of embassy officials and all those with whom they associated, the FBI learned that Germany was recruiting American Nazis for its espionage service. In 1939, Nazi fronts like Fritz Kuhn and his German-American Bund were flourishing. The Germans said they were only social gatherings. But the FBI knew that these societies were part of a well-laid German plan to build up a fifth column in the United States. In 1939, on the campus of a Midwestern university, not far from Columbus, Ohio, there was a brilliant young student Born of German-American parents who were proud of his college record, he was preparing to become a diesel engineer. His name was William Dietrich. Just before graduation, Dietrich was approached by German representatives 
who offered him a free trip to Germany and a well-paying job on arrival. Dietrich reported the incident to the FBI. When the meaning of the German invitation was explained to him, Dietrich offered his services to the Bureau. With money generously supplied by the Germans, Dietrich bought passage at the German Tourist Bureau in New York City. The Germans felt that Dietrich was an extremely valuable man. So did the FBI. 10 days later, Dietrich was 3,500 miles from New York, in Germany's great port city of Hamburg. On the Klopstockstrasse was a second-rate hotel, the Pension Klopstock, which housed the German high command's notorious school for spies. Here were trained hundreds of recruits for the Abwehr, Germany's super-secret espionage and sabotage service. Like Dietrich, Many of his classmates had been recruited in the United States, and back to the United States they would go when they were properly equipped. Synthesis of the FBI's counter-espionage offensive in World War II is the Christopher case, which opened, as great cases often do, by accident, a little accident at Bowling Green in New York City. Might as well take it easy, Joe. He's true. Somewhere in the dark web of war was Christopher, the dead man's companion, the man who had retrieved his friend's briefcase and vanished. Who was he? He's got a Spanish passport, Francisco Ruiz. Hey, Doc, look at this. It's all in German. Stuff about ships, I think. And here, Brandkerngeschoss. That means, uh, that means incendiary bullet. Weight, 148 grains. Load, 46 grains. DuPont 1127 powder. Can you read Spanish, too? Something funny about this. We better get his fingerprints and turn them over to the FBI. Fingerprints. To the desk of FBI Inspector George A. Briggs came the report on the death of Francisco Ruiz. In the FBI Identification Division are nearly a hundred million sets of fingerprints, so organized that it takes less than five minutes to identify a set of fingerprints with those on file. No fingerprints were listed under the name of Francisco Ruiz, but regardless of name, once his print was classified, a search for the individual's identity was a simple matter. The 
there's something coming now. Yeah. It's in cipher. This stuff is fugitive. We better get a shot of it before it dissolves. You set? Okay. Send a copy to cryptanalysis. Yes, sir. Is this what you're looking for? I don't see. Certainly is. Thanks a lot, Quinn. Here it is, Mr. Briggs. Oh, thank you. Uh, Christoph wird sick of. Process 97, concentrieren. Herr Christoph wird sich auf Process 97 concentrieren. That translates, Mr. Christopher will concentrate on Process 97. What's that? Oh, well, Herr Christoph, Mr. Christopher will concentrate on Process 97. That's all? That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Inspector Briggs knew that the most important American military secret in history was Process 97. Set up a conference with military and naval intelligence immediately. That's all. In several remote places, under strict military protection, American scientists were developing Process 97, the secret ingredient of the atomic bomb. An explosive derived from the metal uranium so powerful and devastating that one relatively small bomb gave promise of having the destructive power of 20,000 tons of TNT. A presidential directive gave the FBI the responsibility of coordinating all counter-espionage investigations. At a series of conferences with Army and Naval Intelligence officers, the FBI reviewed the case of Francisco Ruiz, from whose effects had come the startling information that foreign agents had learned about Process 97 and were actually attempting to steal the secret. Plans were formulated to erect an impenetrable and absolute barrier. Have you any other information, Mr. Briggs? No, not at this time. Mr. Briggs. Yes, Admiral. Who is this Mr. Christopher? I wish we knew. Meanwhile, after six months of intensive training, Dietrich had completed his course at the Pension Klopstock and was ready for assignment. For your first needs, $50,000. You will make three contacts only. Elsa Gephardt, Colonel Hammerson, and Adolf Klein. You will keep them in funds. Yes, sir. When you reach New York, go directly to Elsa Gephardt on East 92nd Street. You will establish contact with Hammerson and Klein through her. Yes, sir. These are your credentials. They are on microfilm. You will need these, draft card, registration, classification card, birth certificate, driver's license, New York State, Navy and Army discharge papers, social security card. No one could tell them from the originals. One thing more. There is one person in the United States who can countermand the orders I have given you. If you receive instructions from Mr. Christopher, abandon whatever you may be doing and place yourself entirely at his disposal. Mr. Christopher, is all of this clear? Yes, sir. Well, 
Goodbye, Colonel. Goodbye. Within a few days, Dietrich was in Lisbon, Portugal, communication center for international espionage. He went immediately to an address given him by the FBI. Say, there's something wrong with this watch. I wonder if you'd look at it. I'll have to examine it. Would you please? I'm sorry, sir. I won't be able to repair this watch. I understand. Thanks. Thirty-two hours later, a special courier coming by transatlantic clipper brought Dietrich's credentials to FBI headquarters in Washington. Inspector Briggs was given the responsibility of solving the Christopher case. Behind him were all the resources of the FBI. Uh, that translates, William Dietrich is specifically authorized to receive all reports for transmission direct. Two, sie sind instruiert, sich an ihm für allen Zahlungen zu wenden. That means uh, you're instructed to look to him for all payments. Mm -hmm. Three, es ist ihm nicht erlaubt, mit den ihnen bekannten Agenten in Berlin zu kommen. Uh, that would mean he is forbidden to have any contact with agents known to you. Change that last line. Change it to read. He is authorized to contact all agents known to you. Right. Is that a new watch? Yeah. Did it cost more than $100? Well, I don't remember exactly. Do you mind if I take a look at it? Certainly. There you are. Now, what's the value of this watch? Oh, it's about $90. Thank you. Here's your watch. Oh, thanks. You can get out that way. Just off Madison Avenue in uptown New York, there was a five-story dwelling. This was soon to become known among all FBI men as the house on 92nd Street.
May I help you? Miss Elsa Gebhardt? Yes. I'm Bill Dietrich. I have a message for you from Felix. How is Felix? Uh, you mean Felix Brown of Miami, of course. I mean Felix Strassman of Hamburg. He asked me to pay his respects. To give you these. Would you care to sit down? Thank you. The new one has arrived, Bill Dietrich. I have his credentials here. Max, turn off the light. He's authorized to contact all agents known to you? Everything all right? You'll want your credentials back. Yeah. I brought you some money. You know what I'm going to do over here? I've been expecting you. I understand you can help me make certain contacts. Yes. We can start right away. Would you come with me? This is Bill Dietrich. Where'd you come from? Germany. Vienna, in Germany. Hamburg. Pension Klopstock. Klopstock Strassen. Who gave you instructions to come to America? Colonel Strassen. How did you get here? I came by freighter. From Hamburg? No, from Lisbon, Portugal. When did you leave Lisbon? Three weeks ago. How long did you stay there? Two days. I had to wait for the freighter. You stayed on the cover? Yeah, at the Grand Hotel. Whom did you contact in Lisbon? No one. You're sure of that? I had strict orders not to contact anybody. When did you get here? I don't see why I have to answer all these questions. Didn't you show them my credentials? Yeah. We seen them. Maybe he doesn't want to tell us when he got here. Is that right, Mr. Dietrich? I have no authority You to... got off of the boat at 10.17 this morning. You left the pier at 10.50. You took a cab to the Martinique Hotel at 32nd and Broad. You checked in and stayed there until 12.30. Then you took a bus to 42nd Street in Times Square and walked to the Silver Dollar at 46th Street and had a cup of java. Then you come here. Why didn't you come right here? Why did you go to a hotel? Well, I wanted to take a bath and I... Well, it looks like you know all about me. Yeah, we're going to keep on knowing. Before you arrived, we worked in small groups, unknown to one another. I see. What's so special about you, Mr. Dietrich, that you are allowed to know all our agents? Those are the orders. It looks like we're all taking a chance on you, mister. Everybody takes a chance. Hamburg wants their agents to be in a position to send information direct, through me, in the event of emergencies. Who are these people? Max Korberg, Konrad Arnold. They used to be with the Eisner Wachtbund. Johanna Schmidt, she has special duties. Gestapo, I know about you from Hamburg. What do you know? Usual things. What's your job? We've got to get stuff through faster. 
Radio's best, so I'm going to set up a short wave station. I'll need some help. What kind of help? Radio parts, mostly. It'd look suspicious if I bought them all myself. What do you want? Well, I have a list here. I'll let you know where you can send them. This stuff is hard to get. I know, but Hamburg needs a station here. Conrad will get them for you. As soon as I find the right location, I'm going to open up an office. People with information can contact me there. Send me word as soon as you're ready to operate. I'll get it to the others. I want to contact a uh, Colonel Hammerson. I can arrange that. I have some money for him. Well, I want to get started as quickly as possible. Certainly. So that's the guy from Hamburg. What do you think, Elsa? He has good credentials, but... How do we know? They look good, so what? No. No, I don't trust that guy. He knows too much. We won't take any chances. I'll check with Hamburg for confirmation. How? Hammerson. He can get a message through by mail to Brazil. A courier will take it by Italian Airlines to the car. It's simple from there. Max, contact Hammerson. Tell him I want to see him today. Yeah. Following a prearranged plan for maintaining contact with Dietrich, Inspector Briggs set up a special office in New York City. Here's some air aid literature for you to pass out. Right. Now, I want to know who actually lives in that house and what floors they live on. Shall we get a layout of the outside? No, we'll get that later. Okay, we'll get right up there. Good morning. Good morning. Is the superintendent in? No, he isn't. Can I help you? I'm his wife. Uh, this is in regard to air raid precautions. Air raid? We are at war. <laughs> no, not yet, ma'am. We hope, of course, we won't be. But if war should come, all of us want to be ready. Yes, of course. Uh, we're making a survey of everyone living in this block. What is your name, please? Castle. Frida Castle. Would you let us know who's in the apartments here? Just Miss Gephardt. She rents the whole house. She has a dress store. Miss Gebhardt, your husband, and yourself. That's right. Uh, are you here most of the time? Yes. My husband is a pianist. He goes all over places. I see. Well, I guess that's all. Oh, here's some air raid literature if you'd like. Yes. Be particularly careful about lights. Yes, sir. Just off Columbus Circle in New York City, Bill Dietrich, posing as a consultant engineer, rented an office and established his place of business. The office looked legitimate. He was almost ready to receive callings. Mr. Dietrich? That's right. I believe we have a mutual acquaintance, Felix Strassen. Come in. Felix Strassen, yes, I, uh, I knew him in Hamburg. I feel sure it must be the same man. I'm Colonel Hammerson. Glad to know you. Won't you sit down?
Looking for something, Colonel? I'm just naturally cautious. Just moved in. Things are a little bit upset. Yes, I see. I have something for you. It's a microphone. Hey, Felix. It confirms you have funds for me. And you have something for Hamburg. We'll see. You've heard of me, of course. Oh, yes. During the last war, I worked with Captain Boyed, Fritz von Papen, Count von Bernstorff. This time, the stakes are higher. The personal danger proportionately greater. With my record, I'm very careful. You been here long? Not very long, no. They supplied you with adequate funds. I can pay for information. That's in the credentials. Takes a great deal of money, you know. We're willing to pay. I think perhaps Hamburg might be interested in an entirely new type of gun the United States Army is testing. It's a wonderful gun. I've seen it. Mm -hmm. It projects an anti-tank rocket. Guiding fins are folded inside the barrel. Here are complete details of recent shipments of Bel Air Cobras and Curtis P-40s to England and Russia. This is special information on the new Lockheed P-38s. The speed and armament of this plane is strictly secret. Or was until I got hold of this. I'll send these to Hamburg. Terribly difficult information to get, but there it is. I was instructed to give you this. I was told you could put me in touch with a, a Mr. Adolf Klein. Adolf Klein? For shipping information. I have orders to contact him. I'll arrange it. Good. Cigarette? Thanks. How can I get in touch with Christopher? Why? Well, he's my boss. I've never even met him. He's my boss, too. Yeah? I haven't met him either. You'll uh, take care of me on Klein. Oh, yes. Where will I find him? I'll contact him and arrange a meeting. When will this be? I'll let you know. In a secluded cottage less than an hour's drive from Manhattan, Agent Dietrich set up a shortwave radio transmitter. Hamburg complimented Dietrich on the speed and efficiency with which he got his reports through to Germany and their instructions back to the United States. They did not know that Dietrich's little shortwave radio had a limited range and that all his messages were beamed to a secret FBI long-range radio station not far away. From this point, the FBI relayed Dietrich's messages to Germany on the wavelength and schedule, and in the code that the Germans had given him. He, in turn, received all replies and instructions from Germany the same way, through the counter-espionage station 
of the FBI. But all messages in both directions were first teletyped to Washington for immediate examination. All messages to Germany were held before relaying until the Army and Navy had rendered them harmless or perhaps had skillfully doctored them to mislead and confuse the German high command. Besides operating his radio station, Dietrich extended his contacts with the German spy ring. As their payoff man, the enemy's agents had to come to him. Some tried to sell information of no importance. Others brought highly secret data. The FBI's hidden movie cameras and microphones recorded all Dietrich's visitors. Hello. Suddenly and disastrously, Japan struck at Pearl Harbor. On this momentous, infamous Sunday, the FBI sprang into action just as swiftly and effectively as the rest of the nation's armed forces. Within 24 hours, all known enemy agents and saboteurs were taken into custody, with a few purposeful exceptions. Important agents like Colonel Hammerson, Elsa Gebhardt, Conrad Arnold, and Johanna Schmidt were left at liberty. This was to justify the continued liberty of Bill Dietrich, and because, watched closely, they could still help more than harm the American people. They still knew, or might know, things and people not yet known to the FBI, such as Adolf Klein and Mr. Christopher. Oh, Colonel Hamas. Hello, Dietrich. Is it sort of dangerous for you to be coming here now? Yes. The war makes everything difficult. Every day they're picking up more of our agents. But I've made contact with Adolf Klein. When can I see him? Immediately. You'll have to come with me now. Good. Where are we going? I'm not at liberty to say. Come on. Calling car 70. Calling car 70. Come in, car 70. Over. Car 70, standing by. Over. Mr. H going down an elevator with D. Mr. H going down an elevator with D. Follow and advise. Over. OK. Will do. Off and clear. <laughs> Here it is. I'll let no client. There'll be someone there to introduce you. Well, aren't you going in with No, me? I shan't see you again for a long time. We've got to be very careful from now on. Good night. Good night.
evening. Hello. Mediator of Climb. Oh, yeah. Glad to know you, Adolf Klein. And Felix. Is that all? Mm-hmm. Well, it takes money to operate. You talk. I'll pay. The Britannia sails for England tonight. Dutch boat, the Delft Dyke, goes with her. She'll join convoy 30 miles due east of Sandy Hook. The Delft Dyke carries a cargo of munitions and planes. May I, uh... Have it? Who is that? It's Gus Hausman. He works for me. He's drunk. He is a good man for information when he isn't drinking. Chevalry, Who are these people? They're friends of mine. You're the payoff man. Is that right? That's right, Gus. He's gonna take good care of us. Take care of you. You know where he gets his dope on ships, don't you? I give it all. That's where he gets it. Who's gonna take care of me? Oh, come on, Gus. I'll buy you a drink. Huh? I'll have a drink. How would you like to know that Queen Mary's back again? She's loading 40,000 drums of oil. How would you like to know where she's going? Australia, that's where she's going. And she's full of troops. How much dough is that worth? Hmm? I pay Klein. He'll take care of it. Oh, you pay Klein. Who pays me? I'm gonna take care of you, you Gus. Take care of nobody. You gonna pay off? You'll have to operate through Klein. Okay. Okay. Let's forget the whole thing. Right away and get some real dough. Maybe I'll just spill the inside story on what's going on around here. Yes. I don't know who you are, sister. But tell me again when I come to see you. I'll bring you an nail file to cut through the bars. Look, she knows what she is doing. Five, five, 
That isn't much money to operate. We've got to pay a lot of people. You'll be paid well enough. Have you uh, seen Mr. Christopher lately? Hey, who are you? You were told about me? Don't you trust me? You know, you're fooling around with a lot of stuff that's none of your business. Now, wait a minute. I thought it was... I've got to be sure that my information is getting through. That's my job. Maybe. But I've got to be sure. I'm going to send my information through Mr. Christopher. I'm working for Christopher. And what are you asking about him for? Well, the wars change things. Only Mr. Christopher can change things. Well, that's the way you want it. That's the way it's going to be. Well, you're sticking your nose in things. You might take a little trip with Gus. Good night, Klein. I don't even know you. Where have you been? I just came from the office. Where were you last night? The radio station. Weren't you supposed to meet Klein last night? Yeah, I met him. To get this to Hamburg, just as fast as you can make the transmission. What is it? If we hadn't done anything else in all the years we have been here, this information would be more than worth it. It's up to you now. This is your chance. I'll get it through. Cigarette? Thank you, I don't smoke. I see them? You'll have these papers back here tomorrow night. Tomorrow night? That's a tough order. I've got to put this in code. It'll take time. Orders are not to be questioned. It'd save time if I could burn them when I was finished. This information will also be sent by mail tomorrow night. These orders come from Mr. Christopher. Christopher? Yes. They were delivered to me less than an hour ago. I just saw Dietrich leaving. Did he tell you about that off Klein? No. What about him? He was picked up last night. Violation of selective service. FBI. Dietrich was with him. When he was picked up? That I don't know. He didn't tell me. I wonder if he knew. We've got to be careful about Dietrich. Have you been able to get through their confirmation copy yet? Well, it takes time. With a war on, there are a lot of restrictions. I won't be satisfied until I have it in my hands. 
Have you any reason to suspect him? No. There may be nothing at all to worry about. But until that confirmation copy comes from Hamburg, he must be watched. We are doing our most important work right now. Dietrich is a vital part of that work. If he fails, we all fail. Max. Yeah? Get down to the radio station. Cover Dietrich and keep him covered. Less than an hour after Dietrich received his instructions from Elsa Gebhardt, an important envelope reached Inspector Briggs. The envelope contained the data Elsa Gebhardt had given him, together with an important clue, the cigarette butt, stained with lipstick, which Dietrich had found on Elsa's desk. The contents of the envelope were so unusual that Inspector Briggs rushed to FBI headquarters in Washington. And presently, a distinguished physicist, sent for by Briggs, was flown to Washington. He was Dr. Arthur C. Appleton, 72-year-old chief of the Central Laboratory, where the final secret experiments on Process 97 were being conducted. Gentlemen, these papers contain data on process 97. It is appallingly accurate. These are details of experiments which we made barely two days ago. Dr. Appleman, we must send this information on through to Germany. Now, would it be possible to change a few details in order to set their scientists off the track without arousing the slightest suspicion? Of course it is. It would? We've been thrown hundreds of times ourselves by the slightest error. Hmm. Now, we're going to need your help to change that data. Do you think you can do it tonight? I can start immediately. Inspector Briggs ordered the central laboratories placed under strict and continuous surveillance. Through an X-ray mirror in the rear of an ordinary delivery truck, movies were taken of even the most trusted individuals working on Process 97. This method of surveillance enabled the 400 FBI agents now assigned to the case to become familiar with the faces of every worker permitted to leave the plant. This facilitated the FBI's difficult job of tracing all of their activities and all of their contacts. The cigarette which Dietrich was shrewd enough to take from Elsa Gebhardt's desk was examined by FBI technicians. Without a doubt, the woman who had delivered the data from Mr. Christopher was the woman who had left the cigarette. It was still the only lead to her identity. First, a portion of the stained cigarette was examined by spectrograph to determine what properties it contained. The lipstick could then be identified by comparison with all known brands in the Bureau's files. That's fine. Send it along as soon as you can. Here's the lab report on the lipstick. The analysis revealed a particular brand of lipstick used by 98 different beauty parlors in New York City. By checking the clients and operators of these establishments, Against the records of every known suspect, the FBI narrowed their search to one particular beauty parlor and one particular suspect, Louise Vaja. Well, what was on the other to cause so much trouble? Don't you know? I understood. Family messages from people in Germany to be smuggled underground. I saw no harm in it. 
perfectly innocent messages. That's all. Now, let's stop this little game and get down to real honest facts. I've told you the facts. We know a great deal about you, Ms. Vajja. You once worked on a North German Lloyd liner. You were a hairdresser. You used to bring across letters from Germany and mail them when you got ashore. I never knew what was in them. They were letters of instructions to German agents in this country. And you were working as a courier for the German Secret Service. Right now, you're what we call a sleeper agent. You were planted here a long time ago by the Nazis. You lived a normal, inconspicuous life for years. Making friends, earning a living, just waiting until you got a call for the one particular job. And they saved you for a big one. But you made one mistake. You took the trouble of becoming an American citizen. And that, Miss Vajja, makes you a traitor. I've done nothing since the war began. Nothing, I swear it. All right, now let's get back to this envelope. Where did you take it? I was told to take it to a house on 92nd Street. And who told you to take it there? I don't know. Could it have been a name like Mr. Christopher? I don't know that name. Are you sure? Yes, I know the name, but I don't know who he is. I've never seen him. Have you ever delivered messages any other place? Just the house and to a bookstore. Bookstore? If something goes wrong, I deliver the messages there. What bookstore? It's on 59th Street. I, I think the name is Lang. Aren't you sure? Yes, it, it's Lang's bookstore. You have a friend who's a scientist. He's engaged in very important war work. What is his name? I have no friend. Yes, you have, because he visits you at your home. There is your friend. And there is your home. And the name of your friend is Charles Ogden Roper. <laughs> Keep this young lady in custody. I want a surveillance made of Lang's bookshop on 59th Street. Right. We've been through the Vodger apartment. Oh, you find anything? Yeah, we found the typewriter and the checks. That's the one that was used to copy the data. And then Roper is the man who's been getting it out. Shall we pick him up? No, we can't pick him up until we find out how he does it. Well, we've got a man under 24-hour surveillance. He never leaves that laboratory without being thoroughly searched, and still he's getting the stuff out. That's our problem. That's what we have to solve. How does he do it? How does he do it? The following day, an unusual message from Germany was picked up by the FBI monitoring station and relayed on to Dietrich. It was also teletyped to Briggs. New York, last three numbers, one man driving.
Let me see your driver's license. I haven't got it with me. Well, let's see your registration card. I haven't got that either. Okay, buddy, you better come down to station house with me. We want to check up on you. Have you anything to say? I prefer not to say anything till I talk to my lawyer. All right. What's your lawyer's name and telephone number? Rector 23515. Ask for Mr. Briggs. You received that message from Hamburg today? <laughs> That's right. Have you done anything about it? Well, not yet, Mr. Briggs. I was about to contact you for advice when the message came to meet you. Oh. We think that this may be the lead that we've been looking for. It might be. What does it mean to you? Gedeckings, Kinsler. That's a, um, a familiar word in Hamburg for a very special type of agent. No. Yeah. It's um, the name of a performer who accomplishes spectacular feats of memory. A memory artist. Memory artist? Hamburg's always looking for people with unusual memories. They take a special course just to improve their memories further. Yes, but do you think that a man even with a a very unusual memory could get those formulas out? All that complicated stuff? Sounds incredible, but that's what they're trained to do. Oh, sure, it is incredible. Memory artist. Photographic mind. A hmm. little bit at a time, well, it, it may be a lead. Maybe it's a solution. What'll I do about the message? Well, you just send it through your regular channels. Oh, anything new on Christopher? Oh, not yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll arrange for your bail and fine. Oh, uh, when you give the message to Elsa, why, be very sore at the police, huh? Yes, sir. Don't overplay it, you know. The FBI had to know every detail of Charles Ogden Roper's life. Yeah, I remember that crazy act, but I can't remember the name. Never could remember names. Does this sound like it? As performed in clubs, Sunday school entertainments, banquets, special parties, demonstrates amazing feats of memory. Oh, I don't pay any attention to that. They always write their own. Performs amazing feats of memory. What kind of feats? What's the angle? Well, you see, people call for things from the audience, you know. They want to hear stuff out of highbrow books. You know, this guy can keep 14 games of chess going at the same time. Chess? Boy, there is a lousy game. But 14 games going at the same time would take a remarkable memory. Sure it does, but it ain't box office. I'll take this along. You'll get it back. Don't worry, brother. That act is out of date. Mr. Roper. Yes? I'd like to see you in my office. Yes, Dr. Appleton. This is Mr. Briggs of the FBI. Mr. Roper, my credentials. Sit down, won't you? Do you recognize those? Those are photostats of Process 97. They were stolen from here. I understand that you're one of the workers allowed to leave the Institute. A few evenings each week, yes. And you always spend those evenings with a friend in town. We play chess. Chess. I never go anywhere else. She's an old friend of mine. I've known her a long time. How long? About three years. Shortly after we intercepted this data, $5,000 was paid into your bank account. That money was from securities I'd sold. Doctor, what do you want to know? This gentleman thinks that you memorized parts of that formula before you left here. And when you got to your friend's house, you set them down. 
We know all about you, Roper. We've traced you back to the day you were born. We even know the approximate date that you're scheduled to die. You might be interested in this. That's an intercepted message direct from Germany. It'll save a lot of trouble all around if you'll cooperate with us. What do you want to know? You typed the formula on a typewriter owned by your friend and gave them to her, didn't you? Yes. What other contacts have you made? I received several messages at my friend's house. From a man by the name of Hammerson? I don't remember. You don't remember? A man who can keep 14 games of chess going at the same time and you don't remember? You've been playing with a very dangerous group of German agents. We know, we've seen them work. They don't mind murder. You were the next one on their list, as soon as you finished your job. Did you ever get a message from a man by the name of Christopher? Yes. Now, isn't it possible that Mr. Christopher and Colonel Hammerson are one and the same? I don't know. I, I've never seen either of them. Did you ever deliver Process 97 data to any other place besides Louise Vajer's apartment? Yes, I... After she was arrested, I, I received instructions to take the data to another address. I made my last delivery this morning. And where was that? Lang's Bookshop on 59th Street. I put the material in a book. What book? Spencer's First Principles. And what was it you delivered? What was it, Roper? I gave them the latest data on our final... on our final experiments. Thank you, Doctor. Put that man under arrest. I'm going to call Walker. Yes, sir. For some time, Lang's bookshop on busy 59th Street was under constant surveillance. Every person who entered or left the store was being photographed by FBI agents from an office directly across the street. Can I help you? Yes, I believe you can. Are you looking for some particular book? Yes, but I can't seem to find it. Oh, what is it? Have you by any chance got a copy of Spencer's First Principles? Spencer's First Principles? No, I haven't had a copy of that for some time. I might be able to get it for you. That's funny. A friend of mine said he picked up a copy here. That's very possible. Although it must have been some time ago. No, this morning. I'm afraid your friend made a mistake. Oh, excuse me, I have a customer. I don't think you're going to have any customers for some time. I'm from the FBI. We'd like to talk to you at our office. Now? Right now. Johanna. 
We've got to get this through today. Where's Bill? At his radio station. Now you and Conrad take this out there. Stay there while he puts it into code. Make sure that he sends it, because everything depends on you getting that through. He'll send it. Then bring it back here. Has the confirmation copy on Bill come yet? No. We expect it any time now. The clipper's been delayed. Do you think we ought to take this chance on him? There's nothing else we can do. He's still our fastest channel to Hamburg. We've got to take a chance. Okay, let's go. Where have you been? I've just seen the courier from the clipper. He brought the message. Well, give it to me. Come on. Es ist ihm nicht erlaubt, mit den Ihnen bekannten Agenten in Berührung zu kommen. Es ist verboten, zu kontaktieren, wenn ihr Agents known to you. message for you. You got no business to come here. We have all order to come. This kind of thing's dangerous. We weren't followed. This is from Elsa. You have to send it immediately. This is important. Put this in code. That takes time. Do it right away. Wait a minute. Did you say you can reach Hamburg with this? That's what he said. You are crazy. Look at the coils. They're only two and a half meters. This wouldn't carry more than 20 or 30 miles. This isn't the stuff we got you. That's right. I made a few improvements. This setup wouldn't carry across the Atlantic. How do you know? Cross, I'm going to try. Go ahead. The call signal's AOR. That's not Bill sending. I know his fist. Better answer it. What's that? That's not Hamburg. There's no mush. It's coming from somewhere nearby. Where is it coming from? How would I know? It's not up to me to ask questions. I follow instructions the same as you. Maybe it's a relay station picking up messages from a small set like this and boosting it across when conditions are right. That's a new one. Transmissions across the Atlantic are uncertain. I can't sit here all day waiting to send messages. I don't believe you, mister.
Elsa wants to see you. What for? She don't want you to send no messages. What's up, Max? Got a message from Hamburg. Him? Yeah. Elsa wants to see him. Get going. that do? It'll make him talk. It takes time. Three injections. In about an hour, he'll be answering questions. Well, what'll it do to him? He'll tell the truth. Scopolamine. Drugs part of the brain. I want to know about that envelope and his radio and a lot of other things. We got the picture of the last pickup at the bookshop. Lang's identified the man. Good. Match that with all the film we've got on the Christopher case. The Varger house, Dietrich's office, the gown shop, everything we've got. Right. All you from the projection room. That's the man who picked up the book. Lang's confirmed that. And that's the match. There's no question about it. Frieda Castle's husband is Mr. Christopher, the third member of that household. You mean the man posing as her husband? Yeah. Come on. We're going out and pick up Mr. Christopher. Wake up, wake up and talk. We can wait. You're not going any place. Come on. We're special agents of the FBI. You're under arrest. Where did you send that information? Give him another shot. That won't do any good. Well, he's no good to us as he is. What's the range of your radio? Thirty miles. And someone relays your messages to Hamburg? Who? Who operates the relay? You sold the others out, didn't you? You had them arrested. doesn't tell us what we want to know. Shoot him. Look, let's not lose our heads.
Yes? I'm a special agent of the FBI. The apartment is surrounded. What is it? We'll give you exactly two minutes. Women will come out first. The men will follow, hands above their heads. It's the FBI. Two minutes. Burn everything. Put it in the fireplace. Come on Give me the papers on process 97. We've already failed once today. We cannot fail again. Nothing matters except getting this information through. Our lives, nothing. There's one chance left to contact the courier from Hamburg. I've got to get out of here. You'll have to cover for me. Delay them all you can. It may mean the lives of every single one of us, but this information must be on its way to Hamburg tonight. ended the Christopher case. Elsa Gebhardt, alias Mr. Christopher, was no more successful than other foreign espionage agents. Process 97, the atomic bomb, America's top war secret, remains a secret. After the United States went to war December 7th, 1941, 16,440 enemy agents, saboteurs, and dangerous enemy aliens were arrested. Six have already been executed. Thousands were interned. Others were imprisoned for a sum total of 1,880 years. All of the thoroughly laid enemy plans for a fifth column were smashed before they could be put into operation. Not one single act of enemy-directed sabotage was perpetrated within the United States, nor was one major war secret stolen. The Federal Bureau of Investigation continues to be the implacable foe of all enemies of the United States.